wanted to go for a walk tonight. And uh, this is kind of the strip in our, our little tiny town of Daytona. So it's sort of like our, our historical main street. Um, and then I'm gonna head on over to like the boardwalk. So uh, maybe just kind of talk and rant tonight. When you got time, by the way, I use my work. I'm a woman's fan, no time to talk. Music club and women walk. I've been kicked around since I was born. Now it's all right, it's okay. And you may look the other way. We can try to understand the New York Times affect a man. Whether you're a brother or whether you're a mother, you stay in the lab, stay in the lab. Feel the city breaking and everybody shaking and we're staying alive, staying alive. Ha, 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 staying alive, staying alive. Ha, 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 staying alive. Stay alive. Ha, 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 stay alive. <laughs> hey, fellow brides, beautiful people, children of God, sisters and brothers. Fellow misfits, rejects, <laughs> unicorns, mermaids, whoever you are. Um, lately, <clears throat> just been not doing much of anything, you know? I didn't quite get what Judy was talking about when she said God called her to do nothing for a while. Now I get it. Um, for a while I was, I was really involved in outreach and, you know, it's funny because you start out doing it with the right motive and then there's this strange kind of, you know, as, as you get more and more involved sometimes, a strange kind of pride can creep in, you don't realize it. And you start thinking that you're doing these good things and you're failing to realize that it's only the Holy Spirit in you that's doing those things through you. And, you know, you can, you can get puffed up, you can get prideful sometimes, you can think, Gosh, I'm a pretty good person, you know. I, I feed homeless people. I reach out to, you know, prostitutes. I, I, I you know, I, 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 I'm looking for the brokenhearted. And you, you can, that pride always comes before a fall because it's like, no, you're not good. You know, none of us are good on, in and of ourselves. You know, it's only by the grace of God that we're saved. None of us is, is so bad, God can't save us, and none of us is so good that we don't need His grace, and so anyway, I just, I guess I've kind of been on a hiatus, and, uh, tumbling, you know, um, and I've been going through this kind of heaviness, sometimes it's so thick you could cut it with a knife, you could almost swim in it, but it's just part of the journey, it's part of, of growing, it's, you know, I need to go back and learn some humility, and I need to come back at it with a better attitude and, and, and with more humility and more understanding that it's Christ in me and not me, you know? You never want to do something in your own strength. You never want to let pride come in and, and puff you up or think of yourself as, you know, um, more highly than you ought. And, and you know, it's, it's easy to say that and you know that in the back of your mind. You know that's the right thing, you know, to be humble, but... Sometimes it just happens and, and you don't realize it, you know? You you can get real busy serving God. Sometimes you get so busy in outreach or trying to do things for Him that you you lose your relationship with Him. In an ideal world, that would never happen, but come on, let's face it, you know, some of us, we have a job 40, 50 hours a week, maybe two jobs or three, you know? Some of us are single parents, so when we're not working, we're taking care of kids and and then there's yard work and trying to clean the house and you know your car breaks down and <laughs> people get sick and <laughs> there's family emergencies and you know all kinds of things eat up your time and it's it gets really challenging to find the time to spend in prayer and in the word um and i mean you know it, i it's really easy to mess up it's really easy to get so busy doing things for God that you don't spend enough time with God. You know what I'm saying? Like, like the next thing you know, you're doing it in the flesh and you're going through the motions, but you're not, you're not cultivating that relationship. And ultimately that relationship is what 
you need most of all because, you know, I, I like something Judy said, I think it was last year, that, you know, if you'll, you'll spend 10 hours with God, or I, I'm messing this up, Judy, sorry, I, I can't remember. It was something like this, so something if you'll spend 10 hours with God and one hour an outreach, you'll be more effective in that one hour than if you spent 10 hours in outreach and only one hour with God. Sorry, but you get the idea, and, and it's, it's so true. I find this to be true in my life, and uh, thanks for that little nugget, Judy. That, that really stuck with me. <laughs> it's a blessing. Um, so I've been going through this time, and you know, I've been, oh gosh, you know, I, I have a confession to make. I, I'm sort of a conspiracy theory addict, um, more so than I should, because you know, sometimes you can get so caught up in conspiracy theories. I mean, they're intriguing, they're interesting, a lot of them are true, but but honestly, how profitable are they? You, you reach a point of saturation where it doesn't do you any good to know any more about you know, all these secret groups like the Bohemian Grove and Skull and Bones and the Illuminati and the Bilderbergs and Chemtrails and CERN and, and you, you know, the Mandela Effect and all these. I mean, it, you, you reach a point of saturation where <clears throat> if you're trying to do what Jesus asked you to do in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, it's, it's not helping you. And, and you have to start choosing the Word of God over... You know, it's, 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 it can be addictive. I mean, I'm a curious person. I have a very inquiring mind. I naturally want to know these things. And I've had some thoughts, you know, over, over the last couple of weeks about some of them. First of all, the flat earthers, okay? Yeah, God bless them, but come on, guys. I just, I can't. Uh, first off, is it Isaiah? I believe Isaiah 40, or is it Ezekiel? I'll have to look it up, but, you know, it, it talks about the earth being round, right? That there's there's curvature. Now that doesn't necessarily mean a sphere. I'll, I'll give you that. But but honestly, what does what does it profit to believe the world is flat versus believing the world is a sphere? E even if even if this conspiracy theory were true and the Earth was flat and it wasn't a sphere, how does that really serve Satan's purpose? <laughs> how does you know? How does that really harm God's I don't, I'm sure you could extrapolate and build this elaborate theory, but, but seriously, I've, I've, I've had telescopes since I was a kid. I've been into watching the planets and amateur astronomy all my life, and when I look at the other planets, they're spheres. They rotate, and you can tell they're spheres. You know, balls of gas and rock and whatever else they're made out of. Um, the mechanics of the Earth, the way the moon rises and sets, and the way the sun rises and sets, and lunar eclipses, and blood moons, and blue moons and new moons and the moon phases and the way the moon's tidally locked and solar eclipses. I mean, all of that is explained pretty well with the Earth being a globe, being a sphere. Now, you know, granted, there could be this elaborate conspiracy to hide, hide, you know, the fact that the Earth's flat from us, but I just... You know, I, you reach a point where what does it profit? And then, like, I'm reading about this one guy in California who built a steam-powered rocket or something. He took all these donations from people, and he's going to launch himself 1,600 feet in the air. And I'm thinking, what good does that do? There are skyscrapers that are taller than that, aren't there? So if you wanted to, like, go up high, so, you know, there are mountains that are way taller than that. Climb, the Rocky Mountains are, what, 10,000, 14,000 feet high? Um, <laughs> I mean... Skydiving, you could get an airplane to take you up 12,000, 14,000 feet, you know? Um, so, yeah, you know, I don't know. You, know you, could, you could spend a lot of time on that stuff, but then, and I believe in keeping an open mind, but, but maybe not so open that your brain falls out. <laughs> okay, well, what about CERN, you know, and the Mandela effect? CERN is a particle accelerator. You know, physicists are curious, they want to learn about the particles of the universe. There may be some nefarious things going on at CERN, and I'm not sure why they're using, you know, Hindu gods and goddesses um, for symbolism, but they've, you know, people have always done that. They've always used, like, Greek gods and goddesses and, and just things, you know, statuesque things. That... But here's my main problem, okay? Now you have people that are doubting the Bible because of the Mandela effect. And they're like, oh, Bibles have changed. 
the recent example I was looking at was the lion and the shall lay down with the lamb. And I think a lot of us thought the, that that was the verse. And now it says the wolf will lie down with the lamb. And I don't know, there may be some version out there that says lion and the lamb, but, but honestly, what does it matter? It's just like in some Chinese translations of the Bible, instead of being called the bread of life, Jesus is called the rice of life. But the idea is still the same, okay? And here's the thing. You have to decide if you believe this theory. Um, is God sovereign or is he not sovereign? Do you really believe God is so feeble that he can't preserve and defend his own word? Do you believe that God is so weak and powerless that he would allow man to build a giant particle accelerator, CERN, and, and, and turn back time and undo his word and confuse the masses like that? When God knows that's the one thing that we need to fall back on in our struggle against the enemy. Do you really believe God's that weak? Do you believe God would, if God confused everyone's language at the Tower of Babel because they were gonna build a tower to heaven and, and, and said, this far you may come and no farther, and boom, he just put a stop to it. He scattered them all, scattered their languages, the, the Tower of Babel was destroyed, it fell into ruin. Don't you think if mankind were gonna develop some technology in his futile attempt to challenge God, don't you think God would just flick him off like a gnat? I mean, how big is your God? How powerful is your God? So I can't believe in the Mandela effect at all. I'm sorry. I, because I can't believe in that and at the same time believe that my God is sovereign. I believe my God is sovereign and I believe that his word is, is unchanging and true and that he preserves and defends his word and he has throughout the ages. Think of all the opportunities Satan has had to twist his word, to distort his word. And in spite of all the times Satan's tried, God has somehow preserved his word, a remnant of his true word through the Septuagint and Aramaic and Greek and Hebrew has remained. Even the books that were cut out of the Bible, like the book of Enoch, which is mentioned in the book of Jude, which is a valid book and was included in the Apocrypha, they have been brought back out into the open. And, and as much as the enemy has tried to destroy and hide and conceal and twist and pervert, he has not been able to do that because God is stronger than the enemy. And God is stronger than man. So how could, how could man, why, why would God allow man to do that through CERN or the Mandela effect? I, I just can't believe that. So I have to believe at some point that either we're just wrong or it's a common misconception or we fail to remember. I mean, look, there's, there's plenty of things and the word of God is complex. And one of our biggest issues is we try to oversimplify it. Oh, I love this coffee shop. Brenda really likes this place too. It's like her favorite. Rather than change ourselves to be in alignment with the word of God, we try to change the word of God to be in alignment with our view of the world or with, with our lives. And it's not supposed to be that way. The word of God's a mirror. We look into it, we change. And it's, it's complex, you know? There's so many situations where we try to oversimplify things. Um, I, 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 I think with the earth being a sphere versus being flat is one of them, you know? Ew. It doesn't disprove the Bible to have a globe or to, or to say that the earth is a sphere. That doesn't disprove God's word in any way. As a matter of fact, God's word seems to confirm it in many places. Okay? God's Word's never been afraid of true science. It doesn't run away from science. Science confirms God's Word. You know? It's just like, you know, you have the existence of all these species of animals that are they're either, like, you know, worms and amphibians and reptiles and fish, and they're either both male and female, or neither, they're neither male nor female, they're asexual, or sometimes you have, like, fish or reptiles that are born female and they become male. Or male and they become, I mean, look, the existence of these organisms, these creatures, these insects and plants and fish and amphibians, reptiles, they're out there. And yet, you know, and, and, oh, this place, this is, this place is awesome. Angel and Phelps Chocolate Factory. Oh, you know? 
if I have to choose my own death, I want to get locked in here and eat myself to death inside Angel and Phelps. Okay, they make Godiva taste like garbage. This is sort of like our own little version of Willy Wonka land here. They give you free tours and you can have free samples. They have the best, most amazing chocolate and confections you could possibly imagine. And they make them fresh every day. Uh, is it one in, I think they say now one in 2,000, between one in 2,000 and one in 4,000. I'm not sure, I have to get the figures, but you know, it's, it's a very common birth defect for people to be born with gender birth defects. You have people that are born with deformed, you know, parts, uh, genitalia, people that are born with parts of birth. You have people that have two X chromosomes, like a normal woman, and they have an extra Y chromosome, a male chromosome, so they have XXY. Not just XX and not just XY, there's XXY. Down syndrome is another example of having extra chromosomes. But there are sexual birth defects, gender birth defects that happen that put you in a category that's neither male nor female, but some gray area in between. Um, this place, the Dancing Avocado, oh my gosh, they have the most amazing salads. My favorite is the rainbow salad. And they have a really amazing collection of rubber duckies. Let's see if I can get the rubber duckies. You can buy rubber duckies, man. Can you see all those rubber duckies? They have like every kind of rubber ducky you could imagine. But um, just really amazing salads and fresh food here. This thing here, I just call it the vomit comet. Because if you eat something and you get on it, you are so gonna barf. That's one of the piers over there. And that's where they have um, Krabby Joe's, Joe's Crab Shack, excuse me. I'm trying to get wet hair, I said. But um, they have pretty good food there. If you like crab or seafood, pretty yum yum. And they have like your standard boardwalk stuff, like a Ferris wheel. I don't know if you can see it, I'll have to get a little closer. Here's like an arcade. It's 1.30 in the morning, so none of this stuff is lit up. And then there's like a little roller coaster. And there's a thing that goes around in circles that makes me dizzy and want to throw up. This is a roller coaster. Up here is bumper cars. I don't know if you can see them, but. And that's part of the, over where the moon is, that's part of the roller coaster thing. You know, you have, you have people that are born with like an ovary and a testy, or they're born with Kleinfelter syndrome, or androgen insensitivity syndrome. So they outwardly look like a woman, but genetically they're a male. That's one of our volleyball pits for people that like to play volleyball. Or they may look masculine or like a male, but I mean, there are so many things out there. And yet, I like volleyball and I think it's fun, but I just really stink at it. <laughs> I was never good at sports. You see people look at Genesis and, and, and I've seen people preach Scrappy chairs. You know, just entire sermons and write entire books on God made them male and female. And then, then they go on to say things the Bible never said. Like they twist it and try to make it say like the Genesis, it says in Genesis that God only made male and female. And that nothing exists outside that range of experience of male and female. That, that only male, you know, but that's not what the Bible says. All the Bible says is God made them male and female. It does not say he didn't make creatures that were not, you know, outside of that. It doesn't negate their existence. So science doesn't disprove the Bible and the Bible doesn't disprove science, okay? There's no conflict there. We create the conflict because we try to oversimplify things because we don't, we try to add to the scripture or take away from the scripture instead of read it at face value for what it is. Just like Jesus said, um, you know, there, some are born eunuchs, all right? So they're born, he, he was talking about people that were born in between male and female, are born with all of these syndromes and these defects, and, and they're born in between, they're born outside. He said some are born that way, some are made that way by men, 
you know, surgically, they were, eunuchs were created, their parts were cut off, and they were, they were loyal servants, all right? If, if you read, you know, in the Old Testament and New Testament, there are plenty of instances of eunuchs, and they were, you know, among some of the kingdom's most loyal servants. They were often put in charge of the royal household to take care of the royal family or the king's, you know, wives and concubines because they didn't have anything else to live for, basically, okay? They didn't, you know, there, there was no libido, there was no sex drive there. So they could be trusted around the women of the household. And they were basically very loyal, very devoted, very faithful servants because that was kind of their whole life, you know? If you were a eunuch, you were almost like a pet of that household. You, you were a beloved servant, a very one of the most trusted and loyal servants. You were just a member of the family, okay? Um, and we've, we've lost that concept, but yet, you know, they existed then, they may exist now under different titles and different names, but the point I'm making is, is that we oversimplify all these things. Um, we just totally do, you know? And when you look at all these secret organizations, Bilderbergs and, and Bohemian Grove and, and, and you know, Blue Bloods and uh, Skull and Bones and... Sure, do I believe that, that these secret groups of people that, you know, Luciferians and, and all these people, Illuminati, do I believe that they rule the world? Yes, I do believe that. Ultimately, at the top of every government, you will find people controlled by Satan, controlled by the devil. But I didn't need YouTube to tell me that. The Bible knew that. I mean, people knew that 2,000 years ago. Jesus, Jesus, think about it. When Jesus went into the wilderness, he fasted 40 days and nights and went into the wilderness, and Satan tempted him. And the very last temptation, Satan said, Jesus, bow down and worship me. And he showed him all the kingdoms of the earth. And he said, I'll give you all these kingdoms if you worship me. Just bow down and worship me. And, and Jesus said, away from me, Satan, for it is written, you'll worship the Lord your God. And him only will you serve, okay? But, but think about this. If Satan didn't own all those kingdoms, if Satan didn't have the ability to give Jesus all the kingdoms of the earth that he showed him, it would not have been a real temptation. And if it was a fake temptation, God could not receive glory from it. Okay? God's not going to be glorified by Jesus resisting a fake temptation. Oh, well, Satan, you're lying to me. I, I know you, you can't give me those kingdoms. You don't own them. Well, that doesn't glorify God. Jesus only glorifies God if he resists a real temptation. Okay? If it's a real temptation. So that means, extrapolate, that Satan had to actually have, even 2,000 years ago, you had whatever version of the Illuminati, the Bilderbergs, the Luciferians, the, the Skull and Bones, the Bohemian Grove, you had that 2,000 years ago. Because even then, Satan was in charge of the kingdoms of the world. Because even then, he had the power to offer them all to Jesus. Okay? And, uh, you know, like, I, I look at other conspiracy theories and chemtrails. I totally believe them. But what can you do about them? Seriously, what can you do about them? Maybe there are nanoparticles in our food and in our water and in the air we breathe. But, you know, look at it like this. Child of God, you, you are kept alive by the power of God. Child of God, you are like a cockroach. Satan wants to kill you. He wants to murder you. He wants to take you out. He would if he could. Seriously, every day you get up and go to work, he would kill you in a car wreck. You know? He would have somebody plow into you to, to take you out of the picture. He would give you cancer. He would make you drop dead of a heart attack. He would demon possess somebody and have them put a bullet in your head and blow you away. He would, you know? I mean, he would just give you the flu and you'd die of the flu. I mean, I don't, I'm just saying, do you understand the only reason you're walking, child of God, the only reason you're breathing, is because Satan has boundaries put on him by God. God said, Satan, you may come this far, and no farther may you come. Just like when Satan, you know, the accuser, he's the accuser of the brethren, he went to accuse Job before God. He said, well, Job only serves you because you bless him. He had to get permission from God 
to, to test Job. And God would not allow him to take Job's life, you know? And we may face trials and tribulations, but Satan, unless he gets permission, he can't kill us. Otherwise, we'd all be dead. Come on. He would kill us like, boom, we'd be dead tonight. Boom, we'd be dead instantly. He'd get rid of every single Christian to try to create his utopia, his kingdom on earth without God, without, without Christians, without you know, people who love Jesus. So child of God, the only reason you're alive is because God wants you alive. And when we die, when our time comes, that's when God says, okay, your time's up. That's when death can claim us, but not a moment before. Nobody can kill you before your time. And when your number comes out, nobody can save you. So again, what can we do about it? You know, chemtrails, or what can we do about um, the poisoning of our food and our water and, and Fukushima poisoning the ocean? And, you know, we already know this earth's going to be destroyed and melt with a fervent heat anyway. You know, it's, it's going to pass away. It's, 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 we know that this earth is doomed, okay? And uh, I, just, I just wonder, I don't know. And then... Also, the people who are talking about a deep state and, and a political coup and all. Well, here's the thing, guys. Okay, okay, all right. Eight years Obama's president, I hear so many people. And this is even before I came to God. You know, I, I, I didn't even believe it. But I heard so many people talk about how, um, you know, America was Babylon. And, and, you know, Obama was the Antichrist. And now, all of a sudden, I, I find it amazing the turnaround. Some of these people have turned 180 degrees, and now America has gone from being Babylon. Surely, you know, Babylon, who would be destroyed. Now, all of a sudden, America is the chosen nation. Or America is like New Jerusalem. And Donald Trump is like the savior, the Messiah. And honestly, if you think about it, child of God, doesn't that seem like the strong delusion the Bible was talking about? I mean, come on. If Satan comes to you, he's not going to come to you in a red suit with a tail and a pitchfork. He's not gonna be obvious. Come on, give him credit. He's smarter than that, you know? I mean, Satan's cunning like a serpent. He's wise. He's lived a lot longer than we have. He's, he's really good at deceiving. He's really good at tricking. He's gonna appear as an angel of light. The Bible says that. And so think about it. This, this whole make America great again. Well, it's, it's a kind of repentance with no repentance. I mean, you know, people feel nostalgia for the way America used to be in the good old days, but people are just as mean-spirited, just as unkind, just as unholy, just as full of lust as they were before, you know? And it's nothing but, pe it's another way of saying peace and safety. Make America great again, peace and safety. What does the Bible say? They'll say peace and safety and suddenly destruction comes on them. <laughs> Jonathan Kahn, we talked about him. And remember how when Israel sinned, rather than repent, she said, we'll rebuild, we'll rebuild, we'll rebuild our walls and make them greater and stronger than before. Isn't that exactly what America did? So my question to you is, the real conspiracy is, aren't we now living under the strong delusion to believe a lie so that even the very elect would be deceived were it possible? And I think some of the elect have been deceived. They seem to think that America is no longer Babylon, that now America is the chosen one again, that America can be saved, that, that I mean, you know, when God's message all along is come out of her, my people, come out of her, come out of her ways, out of her culture. Look at our politicians who preach family values and yet they live godlessly. They're caught doing the very things they preach against. You know, 30 Republican politicians who preach against uh, the gay lifestyle have been caught in gay relationships. <laughs> who preach family values and they're caught in one act of adultery after another, fornication. There's this person I love on YouTube I'm not going to name names. I'm not here to condemn anybody. That's Satan's job, not mine. So I'm not going to name names. Don't guess. But, but I was very disappointed. I love this person. They have like 
thousand subscribers. Popular. But they started preaching that, you know, they, tried, they basically redefined fornication. They said fornication is, is it's, it's, it's okay to have sex with somebody when you're not married to them. But as long as they're not married, because, and they said that the real sin of adultery is not the sexual sin, but it's the fact that you're depriving a man of his property, and he just, and it's okay to look at pictures of naked women and porn, and you know, look, I'm, it's, it's one thing if you stumble and fall. And, and you can say, hey, I stumbled, I fell, I fell into sin, and you ask God for forgiveness, and, and, and you pick yourself up, and, and, and you, and you repent, and, and you try again. That's one thing, but, but it's another thing when you say that sin is no longer sin. When you try to redefine sin and say that it's no longer sin, and he he believes all that, and yet, you know, but he believes that you know, it's it's wrong to be gay. Well, look, having sex outside of God's guidelines, whether you're gay or straight, is sinful. You know, and I don't even need the Bible. I mean, we have the Bible, but. I mean, just the whole, doesn't the Holy Spirit tell you that it's wrong? Don't you feel a measure of guilt? Don't you feel a measure of remorse? Don't you feel dirty and cheap and used when you engage in a sexual activity that's outside of God's plan? You know, the only way you can do sex and feel good about it, truly good about it, and not feel like a used piece of meat or dirty or, or horrible or take the walk of shame the next day. The only way you can even do it and feel good about it is if you do it in God's guidelines because you have a conscience. And yet this person and they're, you know, they're really big on conspiracy theories and talking about all these sensational things in the news that are, you know, fun to talk about, but, but they're redefining sin. They're basically saying fornication is a fornication. And having sex outside of marriage is okay. And as long as you're not gay, and you know, that, how is that any different than, that is the exact epitome of a Pharisee, because remember Jesus gave the example, two men went up to the temple to pray? It says he gave this, this example concerning those who look down on others, okay? And the Pharisee, you know, looked up and said, oh God, I thank you that I'm not like this, this sinner. I'm, I thank you that I'm not like this tax collector. I'm not like this prostitute, this whoever. Okay, well, this YouTuber, He's saying, oh God, I thank you that I'm not like that homosexual, that gay person, you know? I, I do this and I do that and I'm great, I pay tithes and blah, blah, blah. Okay, Jesus said that person, that Pharisee, did not go home justified. But Jesus said that the, per the second person who came, right? The man beat on his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You know, even if you were a gay person, oh no, you know? God forbid he was a gay person or a lesbian or a drug addict, or a prostitute, or you know, whatever you think is the most heinous and unforgivable of sins, or, or sinners, the most unredeemable of people, it doesn't matter. Jesus said that second person who said, God be merciful to me a sinner, he said that person went home justified. Why? Because he humbled himself before God. Because he admitted his sin, because he repented. Because he came in humility and not pride. Hey look, that's where we're going. That's where we're headed. Joyland. <laughs> and there's the roller coaster. And those two red things are the vomit comet. <laughs> Back there. And there's Joe's. Not religious pride and in the I just wow, I just you know? I look at this person that I, I respected, that I loved, that I liked, and I'm like, I'm doing like conspiracy theories, how too many, you know? I I look at this guy, this, this YouTuber, and I'm like, you know, in spite of his entertaining and informative material, it's like, wow, I, I just, you know, what, how did, how did it profit him? If now he thinks it's okay to look at pictures of naked women, and have calendars with naked women, and it's okay to have sex outside of marriage, I, I, you know, I don't, again, I'm not being self-righteous. Look, I'm, oh, wow. They even call it the Vomitron. <laughs> yeah, that's the right name for it. <laughs> 
I guarantee you I've done worse than you. Probably, most, most likely. I, I guarantee you I'm a way bigger whore. Joyland, that's our home in heaven. I've been a way bigger whore in my life than you've ever been. Wow, the moon is so cool tonight. And I still struggle deeply with my carnal nature. I still send... I could get it to the tracks of this roller coaster. Almost wow. every day. I have things I have to ask Jesus, forgive me. I have to get under the blood. I have to... I fail. I have to pick myself up. I have to try again. I have to keep walking, trying to walk this walk of repentance. Until I finally just reach a point where I'm sore and free like an eagle. But you know, I won't give up. And I'm not going to call what's wrong right. I'm not going to try to redefine sin and, um, you know, maybe he thinks the Mandela effect did that. I don't know, but I, I'm sorry. I, I believe God's word has integrity. I believe God's word is unchanging. I, I, I believe God has the ability to, you know, it's, it's kind of like those people who maintain that only one certain version of the Bible is accurate. And I'm like, well, I think some versions are more accurate than others. You know, if they're translated from the Greek and the Septuagint and the Aramaic and, and Hebrew, you know, it depends on looking at the original source document and understanding the grammar and how that was translated. But, but the point is, God, you have to, if you believe the word of God, and the book of James says God's not a respecter of persons. So if you believe the word of God is true, and the book of James says God's not a respecter of persons, God's not going to favor a person who speaks English, King James English, over a Chinese person, or a Spanish person, or a Portuguese person, or a person who speaks Swahili, okay? God is going to provide, through His Holy Spirit, God is going to provide a translation of His Word in every language, so that people of every tongue and tribe and kindred and clan can know Him in their own language. You have to believe that God will do that because God is just and He is fair. And sometimes His Word is all we've got. Sometimes we're all alone in this world. The enemy's trying to kill us and steal from us and destroy us. The world's ridiculing us. I mean, sometimes we're backed into a hole and all we got is the Word of God. You think God is going to let the enemy come in and take that away from us? I can't believe that. God will always find a way even no matter how hard the enemy tries to destroy his word, God will always find a way to preserve it. And not only preserve it, to, to make it available to a people, to a tribe, to a nation, to a kindred, to a clan, in their own language, in a way that they can understand. It's, it's the idea, the metaphor that's important. Whether in English you say Jesus is the bread of life, or whether in Chinese you say Jesus is the rice of life, it doesn't matter. The meaning is the same. He's the staple, the substance of life. Well, this has been an interesting rant. <laughs> I don't know, I just wanted to have a candid talk. Um, whew, wow, I just, um, wow. Well, I love you, sisters and brothers. I, 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 I hope, I trust he's coming soon. Pray it's this year, you know? I don't have a date, I don't have an hour, but I just trust every, every night when I lay my head down on the pillow, I think maybe he's coming tonight. Every morning I wake up on my way to work. You know, I hope that today is the day that he's coming back and that's just the way I choose to live my life, you know? And maybe some of you think, well, that's, why would you do that? You know, that's like living in despair. And no, it's just the opposite. It's living in perpetual hope. When you don't have anything in this world anymore, when you, when you don't have anything to hope for in this world, and all your treasures in heaven, then living every day like it's a rapture, living every day like that's the day he's coming back, that's the most hopeful way you can live, you know? Because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I 
pray it's soon. I, 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 I know it will be soon. You know? Let's hold on a little bit longer, sisters and brothers. You know, pray for me. Pray for me. I'm just... I'm struggling to grow. I'm struggling to overcome sin. I'm struggling to be what Jesus wants me to be and to change. To put off my flesh and to, and to try to walk in holiness. And I... Sometimes it just feels... Sometimes I feel like I am so corrupt. I feel I feel the darkness in me so strong. It's sometimes it's hard to believe that I can overcome by the blood of the Lamb, but I have to believe that. And I pray the same for you too, child of God. No matter what you're struggling with, I I pray that you know your trials and your tribulations and everything you go through. And as you fight against your flesh to to be more like Jesus and, and less like, you know, I just pray that he's with you and I pray that you were encouraged and uh, I just pray that he holds you in his arms and gives you protection and love in the name of Jesus. I, I bless you in the name of Jesus tonight, child of God. Good night.